This is the revision video for the behavioural approach to treating phobias and the specification identifies that you will need to know both systematic desensitisation and flooding as behaviourist treatments. But before we look at those, just very briefly to say that we must think about the basic assumption of the behaviourist approach, which is that all behaviour is learned. So the behaviourists believe that you will have acquired your phobia through learning, that you will have learned to be scared of something like spiders, for example, and that therefore you can unlearn that, uh, that phobia, that you can learn not to be frightened of something through counter conditioning. So the first treatment is called systematic desensitisation. And when we look at those words, systematic means that you do something in an order that makes sense. And desensitisation means that you are going to become less sensitive or not sensitive at all to the thing that you used to be extremely sensitive to, meaning the thing that you were really scared of. And so you need to, the first thing that the person does is create a hierarchy of fears for the thing that they're scared of. So you go from the thing that you're least scared of within your phobia to the thing you're most scared of in a systematic order. So you can see there the least scary thing is think of a spider and then look at a picture of the spider and you work through until it gets to the most frightening thing, which is to hold a spider. And so what the person is going to do is they're going to pair a relaxation technique with every stage of fear on the hierarchy and it's important that you do the relaxation technique on the first thing that you're scared of um, until you don't feel scared to do that particular thing so first of all you would pair a relaxation technique with thinking about a spider and you do that until you don't feel scared to think of a spider anymore before you move on to the next section so you can see this guy here is doing a meditation technique and your therapist might recommend progressive muscle relaxation technique or breathing exercises or meditation or something that works for you. But you will do that exact technique in, at each stage on the hierarchy. And so you are it's also called gradual exposure therapy because you are gradually and slowly desensitizing to the thing that you're scared of and you are pairing that intense calm from the relaxation technique with each thing that you're each part on the hierarchy so that in the end even when you're holding a spider in your hand you associate the um, the relaxation with the phobic stimulus in this case a spider and so that means that you've replaced it you are now associating a spider with calm and relaxation and so your phobia is cured and it's important that you know the right terminology as well. So the spider was the original conditioned stimulus that caused the original conditioned response of fear. And then you're pairing that conditioned stimulus, that original conditioned stimulus of the spider with a relaxation technique, which becomes the new conditioned stimulus. But what and so you still get the fear because you're you have to work through the hierarchy. But as you do that, eventually that original conditioned stimulus of the spider is going to have a new conditioned response of relaxation and so your phobia is cured and systematic desensitization will often refer to that as your original conditioned response that it is extinguished because you have replaced it with relaxation flooding is very similar it's a behavioral therapy and the only difference really is that it is not systematic so instead of working through a hierarchy of fears you are exposed to the most frightening aspect of your fear on the hierarchy straight away so you can see there's a picture of somebody holding a tarantula on their hand the most frightening thing and so you would practice the relaxation technique that's important you're still um, trying to associate relaxation with the thing that you're frightened of and you stay there until you feel calm and flooding can cure a phobia in one session uh, maybe two to three hours and when you are incredibly stressed and terrified with your phobia you will be releasing the hormone adrenaline but eventually adren so adrenaline which you should know from biopsychology is the thing that is causing the fight or flight responses it's causing you to have your pounding heart and sweating and high blood pressure because you're absolutely terrified but eventually that adrenaline will wear off your parasympathetic nervous system will eventually kick in and so your body will um, you know feel more calm and that really helps with establishing the new stimulus response uh, response that you've got 
So those are your two treatments and we're going to look at the evaluation for that. So whenever we're looking at a treatment for something, it's the first thing you should really do is say, is it an effective treatment? And there's lots of evidence to show that systematic desensitization is an effective behavioral treatment. So McGrath, for example, found that 75% of patients with phobias responded really well to systematic desensitization and it cured their phobia. Um, Gilroy et al. found that systematic desensitization compared to just relaxation techniques caused participants to be less fearful of spiders after three months and also after 33 months. And another researcher, Capafons, found that patients with a fear of flying showed less physiological signs of fear. So we're talking about um, heart rate, blood pressure, skin conductance, etc. And they reported lower fear levels, so self-report, they said they didn't feel frightened, whilst in a flight simulator than a control group. So the systematic desensitization was um, successful in helping people with their fear of flying. So you've got a lot of research support there to show that systematic desensitization is effective. Another strength of systematic desensitization and behavioural techniques in general are that they are pretty fast and they are suitable for people who are less able to reflect on thought processes. So a researcher called Ollendick uh, from 2009, they found that it was a very fast therapy, especially compared to other therapies like cognitive behavioural therapy, and that they required less effort on the patient's part than things like cognitive behavioural therapy. Because Cognitive behavioural therapy is thinking about the thought processes and that means it takes a lot of mental effort from somebody to kind of change their way of thinking. The behavioural technique was just a kind of learned response. It was like getting your body to associate relaxation with the spider or the thing you're frightened of. So you don't have to think about why you're frightened about it or change your thinking on how on that particular thing. It's also suitable to use for people who are less able to reflect on their thought processes, which is a requirement of CBT. So perhaps people who either lack insight into their motivations or emotions, and also perhaps people who are unable to, uh, who might have learning difficulties or children who might not be able to really have that insight into their own thoughts. So it can be suitable for lots of people. Um, a strength of flooding is that it is fast and effective, although opinion is divided. And you can see in this picture here, it's um, a picture of a clown convention. So if somebody was phobic of clowns, then they would go along to this clown convention because that would be an intensely frightening thing for them to be surrounded by clowns. But flooding is much faster than both systematic desensitization and cognitive behavioral therapy at treating phobias. And research has found it to be more effective than systematic desensitization, although there is divided opinion on that aspect. A limitation of flooding is that it has the potential for negative outcomes. So you can see a picture here of someone handling a snake. Um, so they've obviously got a snake phobia and that's probably the most frightening thing that they could do. Um, and it's so frightening that actually we have to question the ethics of it because it can be really traumatic for patients. I'm someone who used to have a dog phobia. So I know how, I know it's irrational, but I know how terrifying a phobia is. Quite often they're trivialised and people think they're kind of fun, like a fun mental health problem, but they're not. Not if you have a phobia, it can really affect your life. So being exposed to the most frightening thing of your phobia all in one go can be very traumatic. And so therefore, um, although you might have ethically given your informed consent to take part, the trauma of it at its highest level is often too much. And that leads on to the next negative evaluation in that it causes high attrition. People tend to drop out. It's too overwhelming. And so if you drop out of a phobia therapy, then you can imagine that's actually going to be detrimental because you're going to be, you know, it might lower your self-esteem and just make you feel so hopeless. I'm somebody who tried um, systematic desensitization for my phobia and it didn't work and it made my phobia worse because I just felt worth like hopeless I just thought I'm never going to get over this but thankfully I persevered and got some different therapy um, so if you get high attrition 
then that's very bad for the people involved. And the last problem with it, this other negative outcome, is it can actually make your phobia worse. If you think about the fact that phobias are maintained through operant conditioning, through that negative reinforcement. So every time you avoid the thing you're scared of, you get these intense feelings of relief and that is rewarding. So if you are in a terrifying situation, like you're holding a snake and then you um, you just leave the therapy, you know, hand the snake over to the therapist and go, I'm out of here and you run away you are gonna have the most intense feelings of relief to get away from that snake. And therefore it's actually going to make your phobia worse because every time you avoid your phobic stimulus, it maintains and stamps in that new behavior. And then another negative evaluation is that learning therapies don't work for all phobias. So remember the behaviorist's assumption is that if your behavior, if your phobia is learned, then your phobia can be unlearned. You can learn not to be frightened of phobias. However, evolutionary fears like fear of heights and dangerous animals are very resistant to systematic desensitization. And I can attest to that because I, um, I could never got bitten by a dog. I never had any bad experiences with dogs. I was just always terrified of them. And I found that systematic desensitization did not work for my dog phobia at all. I had to go for something called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, which I can highly recommend. It's, it's, um, I mean, you could use this as an evaluation to say that acceptance and commitment therapy is a different type of therapy that says you have to accept that you might always be slightly frightened of them, but you commit to getting over it. Um, so, so yeah, so systematic desensitization certainly didn't work for my kind of evolutionary um, phobia. And the other thing is that complex phobia, phobias like social anxiety are resistant to flooding and systematic desensitization because social phobias have a cognitive element. Someone gets a social phobia, they've got loads of thoughts going through their head, like perhaps like people won't like me or I might say the wrong thing. So they've got all these negative thoughts that need to be changed and they're much more complex than just pairing a relaxation technique. And so cognitive um, phobias are best treated through cognitive therapies. I recommend that you um, have a go at uh, an extended essay writing question on this. Um, now, all these questions here, A, B, C and D, are all the same question, but they're worded differently. And the reason I've done that is because I just want you to be aware that the specification says you should know the behaviourist explanation and treatment of phobias. And if that's what they say, that, that's the only thing in psychopathology that they're going to test you on to do with phobias, is the behaviourist explanation or treatment. So all of those questions mean the same thing. They're just worded in a different way and you need to be ready for that in the exam. Um, so maybe pause the video and just have a read through and have a go at that extended essay. And or you could try this timed essay. When you do a timed essay, you should spend some time, first of all, writing the essay out and editing it to make it as succinct as you can, but with as much detail and then practice writing it in 20 minutes. Um, because that's about how long you should try and aim to do it in the exam. So this is a 16 marker with a stimulus and it says that Malik is 28 and has a dog phobia. His husband says, just go and spend the afternoon at Andre's house. He's got six jumpy Rottweilers and that should sort the problem. His friend says, why don't you try watching some YouTube clips of dogs, then visit some cute puppies and then visit Dina, who's got a really gentle Labrador. That might help. And then it says, discuss the behaviourist approach to treating phobias, refer to Malik's situation in your answer, 16 marks. So when you get a 16 marker with a stimulus, then I recommend that you, first of all, outline the theory of the treatment, the behaviourist treatment of phobias. So that means you get six marks of AO1 description to describe the basic assumption of the behaviourist approach, systematic desensitization and describe flooding. So make sure that you outline the theory before you jump into Malik. And you can see that Malik's husband is kind of um, thinking that flooding is the way forward. 
and that his friends is much more to do with the systematic desensitisation. So you do six marks of AO1, then you do two paragraphs, which is worth four marks of the application where you talk about Malik. And I would do two paragraphs, one to talk about the flooding, you know, apply it to that and one to talk about the systematic desensitisation. And then you need to evaluate for six marks. So with a stimulus, it's AO1, six marks, AO2 application for four marks and then AO3 evaluation at the end for six marks. And I would recommend doing three evaluation points, uh, at least one strength and one limitation and one other. Um, if you decide to do two evaluation points, that's fine. Just make sure that it's in more depth because the examiners talk about the depth breadth trade off. And that means either less evaluation points in a lot more detail or fewer evaluation points in less detail. And those are your picture references.